maybe people people might not um, understand it, but we're recording this episode of Hella Black. Five forty nine in the morning. The sun might have just poked out and risen, or risen, whatever way you want to communicate it with, whatever standard of English you use. But <laughs> yeah, we trying to get this to y'all. The city of Oakland has been negligent. I mean, they all forms of how they all through all sectors, through all levels of the of this city's operations, the people in charge are very neglectful, whether it be housing, whether it be healthcare, whether it be education. And now with city planning, as it pertains to fixing the streets of Oakland, because I'm sure you've heard of our legendary potholes, um, they are doing some construction in our neighborhood and they didn't let niggas know until I guess like a couple of days before. And then they didn't come out until three days past the day they were supposed to start. And they doing all this construction hella early in the morning. And we say all that to say we got like a 30 minute window to do this. We tried to do it yesterday, but it didn't happen. But regardless, like I was telling the boss before we press record, you know. We here. Yeah, revolutionary communication gotta come through any channels and in any way, whether you're talking about uh, Nkrumah having to write his book in prison, while you're talking about George writing his book in prison, Jaleel writing his book in prison, the least we could do is record this shit from our living room. <laughs> Nkrumah writing on a piece of toilet paper. Come on, man. We got these nice, I ain't gonna say the brand of the mics because they ain't sponsoring us, but we got these yeah. nice microphones sitting over your grandma's old uh, table, you know what I'm saying, with some nice plants in the room, some feng shui and whatnot, you know, but I think it's dope that we up early this morning because who would have thought I'd be up first and foremost? I used to <laughs> tell you, bro. Five in the morning, you know what I'm saying, to get up to record a podcast. That's what happens you know? when you got something that's bigger than yourself. Though. Hey, it's purpose. You know? yeah. it's purpose. W- woke up, made my prayers, came downstairs. Anybody, you know, only people who probably will respect this too. Made my espresso, too. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Ain't fully done with it, so as I get on with this episode, I'm going to get more and more energy. <laughs> I think the only folks who will probably respect and understand is people who actually record podcasts. Because to record them and to take time to whatever you do, write scripts or write outlines, like if you're not just getting up and rambling, that do, that does take a certain level of... Uh, Mental fortitude, yeah. discipline. Attention to detail. Yeah. It's any like any public speaking or any lecture you will give. It, it takes that type of preparation. So, for folks who don't record pods or might not produce them, they might not understand. Uh, I guess like the type of effort that's going into this. But nonetheless, I will say the only mishap is this is just an example of why um, people need shit property, why people need land, why people need access to yeah buildings because. You can't. You can't. We can't do our job, our mission to its full capacity, uh, and present y'all like clear cut information to, all the time because we're dealing with elements outside of us, right? Like we record yeah. this in our home, so you won't have to deal with cars coming by. As opposed to like if we had a studio, you know, yeah. if, if we just had a studio, but we can't afford it. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna make a shake. Definitely, uh, Oakland can't afford the shit. <laughs> you know, that's why you gotta have capital. Yeah. You know, even uh, Fanon talk about that, you know, to develop in a revolutionary way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah, we need capital to be able to do what we want to do the right way. But we're going to make a shake whatever way possible in whatever conditions we, we are setting. You know what I'm saying? Because that's a uh, claim to be revolutionary. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Just giving you all that context as to, I mean, I've, I would say this is a lot better than, you know, those early episodes. But. Just stay patient with us and, and understand that we making a sacrifice, so hopefully you can sacrifice a little bit of the sound design. You might hear the garbage truck come by because now this garbage truck schedule is off, but just just rock with us. You know, you know the ultimate yeah. sacrifice that we need is for you to go to our Patreon. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Pod. If you like this podcast, if you like that video episode we did, you know what I'm saying? You like the content that we is producing, you know, like we were saying before, it costs money. Takes money to make it, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, if you like what we do, you like supporting our work, you like to support the organizing that we is doing, you know what I'm saying? Go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash hellblackpod. If you can't afford to support, you know what I'm saying? Go retweet one of our episodes, go tell a friend, you know, there's a way still to be actively engaged with the podcast and the support without without money. Yeah, we need some money, I ain't gonna lie, but <laughs> there's ways to support, you know what I'm saying? So, 
You could always follow drop a Hill Black. Drop a comment on our YouTube. Subscribe to that. Subscribe to Apple Podcasts. Give us that five star review. You know what I'm saying? And, and support the real. We haven't got a review on Apple Podcasts since March. So, but y'all listening, y'all listening from all these different countries and. Like we trending and charting in different countries that I never thought, you know, I can't even probably point to on a map. I know the general area, but like we trending in these countries and top 100 in the podcast, you know, but y'all ain't giving us no review, but y'all listening to us. So, man, come on, go to Apple Podcasts, give us that review. Even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts, open it. You know what I'm saying? If you got Android and don't have Apple Podcasts, go to Spotify just hit that five star review. It goes it goes a long way, you know what I'm saying? For people who might not have ever heard our podcast and they see two thousand reviews and it's five stars, you know. Hopefully get to that one day. People are like, all right, yeah, maybe I should tap in with this this podcast only, they call Hella Black. Reviews on Spotify. Yeah, Spotify. So the numbers are pretty low. Um so yeah, go subscribe to Patreon, like and subscribe on YouTube, and leave us a comment. I think we have a really good episode today and it's a byproduct of a cadre session that Abbas is leading right now uh, for those that aren't familiar with the people's programs political education I guess like system or process um, as we have cadres on track either you know in membership or on track to membership and part of it part of your uh, membership process is attending which is now our weekly PE sessions where we either do on like well, all of it's always historical and contemporary, uh, bridging the past with the cont- with the present and hopes for the future. Right, what we would say historical and dialectical materialism. Um, and so, yeah, we now have weekly PE sessions where we go over a book or go over whatever current event is going on. Um, we discuss it and try to ground ourselves in in the ideological, uh, philosophical, theoretical, and uh, the material with our organizing. Right now, Abbas is leading our first cadre, which is the first cadre that went through membership. I think this is like their second year of membership. Yep. Um, and our central committee is also part of like the cadre yeah. process in terms of studying yeah. as well. So that f- book that we're on right now was Direction of the Earth by uh, France Fanon. Um, and the rest of our cadres, cadres two and three, is doing The World Before by Sophia Bacard. And so that's how this podcast episode came to be it's a byproduct of um the questions and quotes and different points that a boss is pulling from that can ground us in the themes of uh revolutionary nationalism decolonization uh socialism um anti-imperialist anti-colonial anti-colonialism right these are some of the things that, that show up in Fanon's book and the first section is concerning violence which I think a lot of people often reduced to just the armed struggle, which is a very important piece, right? Uh, but there's more to it, and so we're gonna discuss that section, not in grave length, again, because we on a time schedule, but also because we just wanna give y'all some key points that we pulled away from it that would allow y'all to go back and do some reading, uh, read it for the first time, or reread it with, with a different understanding. Does that yeah. sound like that sums it up? Yeah, I mean, this is, like you said, this is a book that requires a lot of studying. You know what I'm saying? And, and Yaki said it's a painstaking study and that you got to do to to understand it. So if you read this book once, I encourage you to read it again. You're going to have a different understanding. I don't know, even for myself, rereading it and looking at like my first time I was highlighting in one color. Then I'm like seeing what I would have highlighted differently. Now I'm highlighting it with a different color, you know. And then, yeah. then my third time through, now it's like my pen marks. Then my fourth time through, I'm just like looking at the different notes that I have, you know. So I feel like I have a better the best grasp of, i've ever had on it and i guarantee you if i go reread this chapter again i'm gonna have a whole different <laughs> grasp but that's the the beauty of struggle and the beauty of uh, uh studying because i think when i probably first picked this book up in college i was probably like man why everybody talk about this rest of the earth like all these big words and, mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like especially it's being translated for french so it's like the flow is has a certain type of flow so but this book is a uh, legendary legendary you know, I think even uh, reading David Hillier's uh, autobiography, you talk about Rich, you're like, man, I'm picking up this book. First page, I got a dictionary with me, and I'm like, I'm not understanding any of these words, you know. And if you think about him and then the party and them studying, it's like, okay, 
they was going through these battling through these same contradictions within their cadre and of trying mm-hmm. to understand the book and apply it to the times in Oakland. And, you know, here we are in 2023, like, <laughs> you know, trying to apply the same things that they was applying, um, taking the principles from the book and then obviously advancing it and stretching it to, uh, to now. Uh, yeah. Encourage y'all to read this book. It's transformed. Must read. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't no black pair. You know, the party said, hey, you know, they was reading Malcolm. They was reading uh, Franz Fanon. <laughs> mm-hmm. Had a big influence. So. Yeah. And I, I enjoy the book a lot. Um, and, and something that I was, as we think about how, how dense, how dense it is, depending on where you are in your political education, right? Like it becomes easier to you because each time you're learning more about colonialism outside of the book, right? In your yeah. actual material day, you're learning more about revolutionary nationalism by actually going now you're able programs. to take like these different books that you've read and now you can make sense of Fanon in a different way based mm-hmm. off of the different understanding or, you know, overstanding yeah. <laughs> that you have from these different texts and different contexts and different uh, liberation movements. And then you can apply it to this. You're like, ooh, all right, now I got a little bit more of a grasp. So we talk about national liberation, you know what I'm saying? About the, the peasantry, you know? So, uh, uh, Fanon talks a lot about decolonization. You talk about this process, uh, of what it means to to decolonize. Yeah, I think first we have to understand what colonization is, right? As a phenomenon, is something that sinks its claws into all aspects of life, right? It, it sinks its claws into a society, in in everything that is in the society whether you're talking about the land whether you're talking about the people whether you talk about uh the animals is you just it's all it's in all sectors of society colonization is it subjects all the planets inhabited to the social economic and political interests of the colonizer right uh, it's a physical and spiritual process right um uh, and so decolonization also has to be a physical and spiritual process. It has to be something that rids the entire world of colonization, right? Um, and so I would say decolonization is what happens if we're talking about, and for this specific context, decolonization is what happens when a colonized subject uh, becomes aware of what colonization is and realizes that uh, they become aware of the matrix, right? The lies, uh, the exploitation, uh, the pain that comes with not having control over your daily life, right? Uh, and so the colonized subjects becomes aware of this and becomes aware of how they have been warped and have been misled and have been duped. Uh, and they aim to be a vessel of truth, right? They, they aim to rid themselves of uh, all the lies that they've been told all the ways that they've been subjected to to um, exploitation, to manipulation. And so when you be, when you begin that process of decolonization, it's what you've been saying a lot of like the process of reorientation. And I say it's a reorientation to like, uh, it's a, which George says, right, we need to have a new set of, of, of property relations. I would say it's about relationship, it's about a reshaping of relationships in three areas, yourself, others, and to the land. That's what decolonization is. And people have to realize that it comes with changing your whole reality. I think sometimes we downplay just how strong and how much power colonization has over us. Uh, And so when we realize like decolonization, it's going to turn you into something that you probably can't even imagine. All right. It's with us like going sober. And now you realize um, you can't respond to turmoil and pain the same way that you were when you were unaware. All right, I can't just run away from things. I got to sit with things and question. Like, you really begin to question everything. Why do I eat this way? Why do I talk this way? Why do I dress this way? Like, even with like, it, it, it like the most subtle thing is you will realize like that is a byproduct of someone else of someone else's way of thinking of someone else's priority. All right, like I buy these shoes because shit, it the the capitalists benefit from it. I I like these I like this food because the capitalists pump it in front of me all day. Like you just start to realize all the ways that the capitalist propaganda, the colonial propaganda has a uh, has been forced upon you and how you've internalized it. And so decolonization is that process of ridding yourself of all the values, all the morals, all the norms, and all the practices of the colonizer. Because if you look around right now, like how much of your life is actually a byproduct of your own? I mean, do we even know who we actually are? Like not even on some like metaphysical like dude. 
You know, like it was, we talk about this on the Ramadan episode when all the things are removed from you, all the luxuries, all the, you're not watching TV, so you're not be like, you know, like when you're just really sitting with yourself, who are you? And that's what the first step of decolonization is, actually like, who am I? And then starting to learn your, it's very important to learn your history, right? Because if you start to realize uh, Africa's history start, predates 1619 and all the shit that was going on before that, us doing tales of the town and learning about your family coming from Louisiana, Jamaica, my family coming from Port Arthur, Mississippi, right? Uh, Point Texas, you start to learn all these things and you start to d become a new person. That's what, that's why the new African identity is one of a, a, de a decolonial understanding, right? Of a, of a heightened consciousness, right? And so, yeah, I know that was a, a very no, long, that's, <laughs> no, that's important, long answer, but that's how but I, I think you gave a, like, I like how you talked about it's the, changing of self and then the changing of your relationship to other people as well as the your relationship with the land you know because it's like you said it, you have essentially this part of this colonization process is the uploading of like a foreign way of thinking an alien way of thinking a colonial way of thinking into your mind to where then you were embodying that in your day-to-day -day actions like you said how much control do we actually have you know what I'm saying? Like, even around, like, cravings or something like that. I think about some of those days where it's like, why the hell do I want Taco Bell at 11 o'clock at night? You know what I'm saying? You've been, watch, you, even you've been watching you, TV and you've been seeing advertisement. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm over here, you know, we, we, we watch a lot of boxing, a lot of <laughs> MMA. And what's the commercial that be over and over? It's Burger King. <laughs> I have been to Burger King. I couldn't even tell you where the closest Burger King I ain't been forever. But I'm like, why am I thinking about Burger King right now? Why is that song? I ain't even going to sing it. But you you already know yeah. what I'm talking about. That's already in my mind. Cause that's, that's part of the, like, the colonial process of, okay, now let's make the colonize into a consumer. Like, let's actually like, change the way they're actually thinking. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that, that uh, principle could be applied to different things. You know, whether it's food, the way like you were talking about, the way you dress, uh, your desires the way you interact with the world, what you want from this life, you know what I'm saying, and the standards, because it's, it's like an upload of consciousness. So that decolonization, like you said, it's that reorientation, yeah. you know, the human value, you know? I don't think we realize just... Like, this shit, run, it run deep. You know? Like, like even, even like us being consciousness, conscious of it, we still realize there's so many different ways that we're unconsciously still buying into this colonial system, and we have to fight against that every single day. Because it's like, you can be aware of it, but... We in the sea of it, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, we on this maybe this little uh, <laughs> a tiny island, but you step outside your house, you know what I'm saying? Or yeah. you just all right now, you just turning on the TV. You don't realize the, the way you was being indoctrinated into the way of thinking. Right? Or it's even you know you cannot watch TV, but it's a po it's impossible to be in a society and not and not to be like kind of of it, right? That's what Fanon gets that like. If I cannot watch TV, but if I'm around a bunch of people, a bunch of other people, I start to pick up on their tendencies. So who who do these people get their tendencies from? And then who do the people that they got their tendencies from get their tendencies? And if, you know, it's like it's impossible to be around people and not begin to to pick up on their actions, the way they speak, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they dress. So you cannot watch TV at all. But if you're outside, you feel, but if you're around people, people if you're in the society, you're gonna you're gonna. But well, that's why consciousness, like you said, it's the daily. It's not just daily, but it's like actually moment to moment to think about mm -hmm. everything you do. Literally to think. Some things will become habit, right? But like the biggest habit is gonna be thinking, why am I doing this? Why am I, why do I want this? Why do I want that? And when you, you know, most of the time I can look at my decision, but okay, because I've been told that this is the right thing to do. Like you can just do something. And even if it's not like necessarily harming you, you know what I'm saying? It might not as it pertains to like making you feel mm -hmm. or damaging damaging you like causing you pain in that specific moment like is that really the best thing for, like why are you doing it still it's just just what you told it was right you just, just been told that was how you do things that's how things are supposed to go mm -hmm. uh, and for us it's very it's very important for us to if we know how economics i mean we're gonna get into the i think we're gonna get into the question a little later but uh yeah if, we have to look at who's making the decisions in this country. If you look at who's on who's on who runs the banks, who's on the board, who runs these corporations, who's on the board, like these are the people who govern your life. If you look at the media company, who who's doing the syndication, who's doing the programming, 
right? And what are these people's politics? What do they believe in? Who's running the schools? What are these people's politics? What do they believe in? Because ultimately, the people who are at the top make all the decisions that impact the people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so if you run in a school and you believe in exploitation, you believe that uh, new African people are inherently inferior, if you believe these things, it's going to show up in your policy. It's going to show up in the way that you run the school. Thus, the new Africans in your school are going to be byproducts of something of a system of institutions that believe that the per the person who runs it believes that you are inferior. It's going to show up. It's, it's going to show up, period, point blank. Mm -hmm. Now, how that manifests itself, we don't know. It can manifest in you being a, uh, I'm going to prove you wrong, or it can manifest in uh, a rebellious nature, which we know where that leads niggas in, in this country. If you don't got somebody to harness that, rebe that rebellious nature and turn it revolutionary, right? Uh, so uh, we all got to start thinking about the process of decolonization. And number one thing, we might have to do some editing to this because I want this part at the beginning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> stick through, y'all, because I think this is where it's really good. This is, if we saying for us, we trying to like create other organizers, right? The number one thing is you have to realize that decolonization is a process of sacrifice. It isn't just where you get to make these declarations, get reach these understandings, right? Sophia says it's a difference between uh, understanding and it's a difference between internalizing. The you really have to internalize this shit and say that I'm going to make the revolutionary choice every time. That's a part of the decol decolonial process, right? The revolutionary choice was this morning us saying, like, bro, we're gonna get up at five fifteen and we're gonna record this pop. We're gonna get up and we're gonna like that's you have that's decolonization is making that conscious effort and it comes with sacrifice because so much of the colonial shit is the facade of luxury. And people want decolonization to feel easy. You know, mm. like pulling the nail out of sheetrock. I don't know if you're all familiar with sheetrock, but it's a very, like, uh, porous, like, soft material that you can easily insert a nail. You can easily pull the nail back out. That's what people want this thing to be, is for you to be able to turn over a leaf, so a new leaf so easily. But Du Bois said uh, how impatient I was. I thought the snarl of, of, of years was to be undone in days. I'm saying like be patient with yourself but you got to put that work in every single day if you really going to decolonize your mind and it's a word that's being just used over and over again but you should also know that decolonization is anti-capitalist anti-imperialist anti-colonialism because a lot of people is in these capitalist spaces talking about de decolonize your mind decolonize your spirit like you know that that decolonization in it's itself everything. is anti Europe European American mm -hmm. colonialist capitalist values so we got to understand that for sure yeah, because we sometimes we use it as a, as a buzzword, <laughs> like a decolonization, de decolonize this, decolonize that. But it's a very violent process, and not just necessarily like oh the gun or or the revolution. But if we're talking about like that internal process that has to happen, that reorientation that you was talking about, you feel me? That changing of relationship with yourself and that changing of relationship with other people. The only way you can change your relationship with other people is if you change first and foremost what's within yourself. And right, that shit hurts, and that is a like, it's a very violent problem. I'm, I'm saying like even like that's a violent process, like changing within yourself. Like if we think about we're trying to evolve from a, a colonial mentality to a revolutionary mentality, that means we have to be violent with that colonial mentality within our own minds. People say, "Oh, kill that pig in your head." That is violence. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that process of being getting sober from myself, right? That was like a violent process. <laughs> to, to with myself like nah my body is literally like violently trying to kick out like a dependency in some level to alcohol mm -hmm. or like a dependency on a certain type of action where I'm feeling a certain type of way I might be feeling anxious I might be feeling angry I might be feeling depressed and the first thing I do is go to the liquor store and grab a bottle so ridding myself and changing from that state <laughs> to a new state of sobriety like literally from a scientific level, within my body, it's like the battling of contradictions within, within mm -hmm. my own like cellular structure, you know. So this process um, of decolonization is like a level of like revolutionary violence with your own mind, of revolutionary violence with your own ethics, revolutionary violence with your own soul, to where you're transforming from this uh, colonial, subjugated uh, neurosis and trying to move towards a, a revolutionary. You know, it's a Battle of contradictions, getting to that revolutionary point, and yeah. we're always going to have contradictions, right? 
Um, but I think that's an important process that Fanon is talking about too. Is like, nah, this this whole violent process that you have to engage with yourself in. Like, all right, yeah, I'm gonna focus and study for two and a half hours before I start my day. Like that is literally shifting a process of someone who might have just been on Instagram for two hours mm-hmm. or just catting off for two hours in the morning. And you know what I'm saying? Like that is really reshaping your uh, way of thinking, the way you move, the, the structure in your daily life. I guess that's part of that process, you know, is removing that colonial behavior to a, a new evolutionary, revolutionary behavior. That's, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, <laughs> It's uncomfortable because you, you was using violence against yourself in a positive manner to rid yourself of that old behavior. You think that squeaking is going to come up on there? Uh, A term that Fanon uses throughout the book is referring to the colonized a thing. Uh, Can you tell us why he uses that word? Yeah. Fanon, he be like, he just, I don't know, he be like gangster with his shit sometimes. Like, he just make you really think, like, man, thing. Like, damn, we is some things. Like, we're, we're, not human. We ain't like. Are we really a human beings? Like we can say we black men, but are we really black men? You what feel me? Black? Do we have what does black mean? What does man mean under the colonized subject? If we is a colonized subject, what does that mean? If we is controlled by these imperialist, capitalist, settler, colonial forces, and we is supposedly quote unquote black men, what does that mean? To be a man means to be a human being. To be black, what does that mean? Realistically. <laughs> If that was a, a race science used to oppress us. But if we think about the book title, <laughs> The Wretched of the Earth, man, we the wretched. What is the wretched? <laughs> is, that, or is the wretched a human? Or is the wretched a dignified state? Like if we, you know, look up, you know, like uh, in the dictionary, you know what I'm saying? Like David Hillier said, I'm reading this book with a dictionary right by myself. Or uh, Yaki said, oh yeah, I'll have a dictionary with it. If you look at the Merriam-Webster version, Definition. I'm kind of like violating my own, like, because in college I, I said never use a Merriam Webster. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, like, you get to college and a student will uh, write a paper, like, according to Merriam Webster, I'm like, hey, go find some sources. <laughs> yeah. But if we look at wretched in the dictionary, it says deeply afflicted, dejected, or distressed in body or mind, extremely or deplorably bad or distressing, being or appearing mean, miserable, or contemptible, very poor in quality or ability. Inferior. <laughs> us third world peoples, us colonized people, us new Africans, we is the wretched. We is literally things because we do not live our lives as dignified human beings under this system of settler colonialism, under the system of capitalism. How can we be human beings? That's why we is things. We ain't even real. <laughs> like if you think about it, like are we actually living out a daily life in which our humanity is valued, in which our humanity is respected? Or are we no. subjected to the terrorism of settler colonialism, to the terrorism of Zionism? You feel me? What are we? What are we subjected I mean, to? Objectively speaking, we. I mean, it's what what, what Kwame Ture said. He said, "How are we gonna be Black Americans if we can't do nothing that Americans do? You don't own the clothes. <laughs> you can't do nothing that you don't Americans own the do. food. You don't own the land. You don't own yourself. If you think about that, like." We don't even own ourselves. Most of us is in debt. Even the ones that we say we middle class and we free or something like that. And, you know, you bought your, yourself a house. Man, you in debt to the bank. That car you driving, shoot, the car I'm driving, I don't own it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in debt to the financial services. That motorcycle I'm riding, man, I don't own it. <laughs> These clothes, man, I don't control the cotton. This house, I don't own it. <laughs> the water, I got to pay for it. The electricity, we don't control it. The website, we don't own it. So how do we like even have full? We don't have no f- control of our life, right? So that's why that process of decolonization, that pos- the process of national liberation, is literally like Fanon talk about. It's going from a thing, a thing, a thing that can just be stepped on like a bug, <laughs> a thing that can just be. Uh, determined to move into some other people's will. You feel me? People have the, the, the choice to move this thing to whatever they want to do, to morph it into whatever they want it to be. Hey, Moving right from now. a thing to a dignified human being, to where you have control, political, social, economic, and control of the land. You have control of your thoughts to the best of your ability. You have evolved into a person that actually cares about humanity, cares about community, 
and then other people are evolving with you, making that individual choice to buy now. We as part of a new African nation. Right, that's that process of us decolonizing and evolving from this thing that they have subjected us to, to actually dignified human beings worthy of uh, worthy of life. And what about the person <laughs> worthy who might of life, say, liberty, and justice, man? What, 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 what about the person who might you know be having some some success in this system and say that they you know they got dignity? They might say they have. They got dig- a thing. You said they're not a thing? They might say they're not a thing because they got they own their car. They own their house. Their kids is in Ivy League schools, go to private schools. Like they're not they're not the thing. I'm talking about like if, if what do you tell them? Hey man. You you would think on their terms. <laughs> you would think on their terms. You gave them terms to define your existence. You're defining success based off of their European Western values. Mm. You said, Oh, I'm successful because my kid went to an Ivy League school. What is that Ivy League school founded on? You're successful because you work at Goldman Sachs. What is that institution founded on? How can you say you are successful, but then you have your own people, your own uh, species that you're, you know, your own species, your own uh, quote unquote race is subjected to the terrors of settler colonialism, is subjected to the terrors uh, of this violent system of capitalism. So, yeah, you could. Uh, identify with it and say, yeah, I, I am, I am part of this thing. It just makes you, you know, phenomenal. Say, part of the a colonial bourgeoisie, but really, you were just uh, a copy pasted version that is still inferior to the thing that's in control, aka the colonial system, and you buying into it. So I say, you, you think you're free, but you ain't free. You know, you ain't free either, because they could take it away from you at any moment. <laughs> it can still take away. You go against the grain. You go against uh, this colonial uh, beast. It's going to be taken away from you. Yeah. And they know that. They ain't really fully in control. Okay. But is, is freedom owning your car? <laughs> is freedom owning the house? Is freedom sending your kids to college? Or is freedom your species that you belong to having complete social, political, economic control? How can you be free? How can you be free if the majority of your people is locked up? Or nothing, you know, if, if, if a lot of your people is locked up. Yeah. If your people is poor, if your people is living on the streets. You know, so what, would you, what would you say? The same things. Like, <laughs> like, whose standard of living are you aspiring to be? Like, who are you aspiring to be? Like, who put that inside of you? Who told you that these were, that this was an accomplishment? Literally, it would be a parasite in your, in your yeah. mind. Like, who, who told you this? Like, how is this the mark of success? Now, who told us that this is like? What do you truly believe in? Because me personally, I don't believe accumulating a lot of wealth is the mark of who I am. You know, I, I don't. That's just not what I personally you know. I, I thought it was, but who was I trying to? I was trying to aspire to Western values. Like now, what I want the most is to be able to see my family. You know what I'm saying? Like spend time with the the my nieces and nephews, my youngest sibling. Like that's what I. But the way that life is constructed, that's not even a, an option. It's saying that I can't do that until I make more money. I just feel like that's something that should, like, that's like natural, like that natural human, you know, that, that human desire to be around those that you share the same blood with, those that you have come from, like, you can trace your lineage from the same people. I feel like that's just humans want to be around, and they basically tell me I can't have that unless I make a lot of money. My sisters live hour, hour and a half away from me. My mother lives an hour away from me. And even you know if you think saying? about, <laughs> even in this system of like, okay, you making a lot of money, especially being a colonized person, what does that mean? If you're making a lot of money, usually it means you're working this shit a lot as well. Yeah. you working all this, you know, all this time, and then how much time do you actually have for family too? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like this revolving door. Bro, I was swimming the other day. And when I came out the water, like the sun was shining on my face and I was just like overcome with joy. <laughs> and I'm just like, I want like just swimming, you know, like just like, damn, I, like, I just want to feel that more to feel it yeah, versus, you know, running around all day trying to figure out how I'm going to make some money. You don't even realize <laughs> the sun's out. You know, you, don't even, yeah. you know, like I literally had a moment like that hiking yesterday, like getting to the top of the hill and then looking and seeing the sun is like starting to set. And I'm like, the sun look crazy right now 
it's like hella bright, but like I could actually look at it because the clouds is kind of out. You know what I'm saying? And it ain't hurting my eyes. I'm like, is this the sun or is this the moon? Like, I don't know what. It but it was like, and that's how that's how life should be. It's so much <laughs> things on this earth for us to appreciate. And I just think about like when we was watching the, uh, the Izzy post fight, and he was like, I hope every person in the world can at least just feel this shit. person. Like I want people to feel that every day. Like just some sense of wanting to be alive. Yeah. And I don't think many of us feel that every day. You know, yeah. like I don't think people. And why would you? Uh, especially as new African people, as new African poor people, working class people, why should you? You spending 12, 14 hours at your desk. You spending 12, 14 hours at the assembly line getting 30 minute breaks. It's like every day is a hamster wheel, a mundane hamster wheel. Like, why? you know, it don't got to be that way. It, it it don't. And once you are be able to become conscious and start to, you know, what should we say? Revolutionary nationalism is the ability for all people to contribute to the building of society. Right to really start to be like, yo, like, what do we want this to be? And a lot of us ain't, haven't even thought about that. Like, how do we, from a, the most basic city planning, how do we want our our streets to look? How do we want the signs to look? How do we want the buildings to look? What's the, how what's the flow of traffic? Where's the food being grown? Like, these are decisions that people should be contributing to. They say we do why do we just get back lanes now? But, you know, <laughs> they say that's what that's what electoral politics they claim is supposed to do, Man. but it's not true. It's a facade, electoral, bourgeoisie you know, politics. You know, none of y'all are contributing to society except for every four years when you're going to cast that ballot. And are you really contributing when the decision has already been made for you? When the you? corporations pump the people in front of you when they've when been planning gonna, this 50 years down the line? You know you what I'm saying? You choose between Biden or Trump or DeSantis or whatever, who, whoever going to be up there, you know? But uh, First two parts, it's about if we got deep process of decolonization, becoming new people, and identifying or saying I like, for non calling us things because who what how can you really be human in this society? The masses of black folks, look at the numbers. How can you be, be how can you be human? I mean, like uh El Haj Malik was saying, we we moving from civil rights to human rights. If we use fighting for human rights, does that mean we're human? No. We use things. <laughs> Trying to fight to make ourselves dignify human beings. You got to ask yourself this. Since 1950, the Hispanic population has grown from 2 million to somewhere around 60 million. The white population has went from, I believe, like 160 million to 231 million. The black population has went from 15 million to 40 million. 40, 41 million. What are the causes for this? It ain't niggas going back to Africa. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> it ain't niggas going back there. So, like, what what are the conditions that allows the Hispanic population to go from two to sixty, the white to go from one forty to two thirty, and the black to go from fifteen to forty? What are the conditions? You know, we we got to start looking at some of this stuff. Got to be honest. <laughs> it got to be honest. Got to be honest. You know, I think what's interesting about uh, rest of the earth is that. I don't know. I, th I think sometimes uh, Marxists will take it on one. Like, oh, yes, it's just a Marxist one in this text of uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe. But I don't know. I feel it's my own feelings, my mm -hmm. own uh, own uh, analysis. Sometimes I go, oh, it's just this pure Marxist uh, expose. <laughs> it's not. Fun. It is definitely not. Yeah. Um, but what I appreciate, appreciate about Fanon is he talks about uh, Marxist analysis should be stretched when it comes to addressing the colonial issue. So what does uh, uh, Brother Fanon mean by this when we talk about stretching what they call a Marxism? Well, first off, we need to clarify what Marxism is because I don't think Marxists know what it is. And <laughs> this is, well, I don't even want to say, we're just going to clarify because I, I, I don't know, it's like, I want to create the space for them to like take this in and not get hella triggered in because it's kind of hard to talk to them. You know, like the moment you start talking about Marxist Leninism with a Marxist Leninist, like they just be hella defensive. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know what it is, but I'm just gonna speak to objective facts, what I believe are objective facts based off research and understanding and common sense. But first off, Marxism is a school of thought. Marxism is not a methodology. It is something that people subscribe to when they align themselves with Marx's analysis on social and economic development. Marx did not say, this is my, this is Marxism. This is what I'm coining it. Marx was a dialectical materialist. That was his methodology in science. So Marxism is not a methodology in science. It is Marx's interpretation of the dialect of dialectical materialism as it pertains to the state of international finance capital in the 19th century. Is that fair? Like, yeah. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not Marxism is not dialectical materialism is the science in the method. I mean, was Marx ever calling himself a Marxist? No, he was saying I'm correcting Hegel's dialectic of idealism with materialism, where Hegel says that uh, thoughts shape reality. I'm saying that no, matter is primary, and that it exists outside of man. That's what he was, I'm correcting the dialectic. That's that's what it's very simple. Now, if people can go and you don't got to read Capital to understand that. You don't got to read State and Revolution to understand that. That's just basic. This is basic science, basic approach. Dial- my, Marx was a dialectical materialist. So a Marxist is someone, well, Huey says, a Marxist is someone who worships Marx and worships the thought of Marx. That's what a Marxist is. And so what Fanon is urging us to do is to stretch the methodology of dialectical materialism, of understanding that all matter is connected and constantly changing, that you cannot apply a Marxist analogy or Marxist understanding. You can, you can use it historically to say, okay, in the 19th century, international finance capital was here. In the 20th century, international, fin- ca- international finance capital was here. How are the class stratifications increasing? How, are the pro- how is the proletariat shifting, right? Especially in, in Africa, um, we have to understand that the proletariat grows out of, the, out of industrialization. That's where Marxist framework is coming from. Now, where do you go in Africa? Marxist is coming from a European framework of industrialization. For one, of industrialization, right? So you apply it to Africa, who isn't who isn't as industrialized, right? And it's also dealing with the phenomenon of what racism. You know what I'm saying, like that's what dialectical materialism tar- it, it it urges you to look at the objective facts and to start to use history, right? Historical dialectical materialism. Look at history and look at where things were in that time and how people used it. And responded to those conditions. Look at your current conditions, and what do you want for the future? That's what. So Fanon is saying, like, yo, look at yes, Marx had an analysis on class and how class has come to be, and how there's just how there's inherently going to be a struggle between the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, and the peasantry. That's just going to naturally happen because what they have their demands. The the bourgeoisie have their demands. The the masses of the workers and the peasants have their things that are not being met because they're being exploited by the bourgeoisie capitalists. Right. That's these are the, these are the analysis that Marx is making. That's objective facts. We can we can understand that. But Marx is not dealing with uh, the fascist weapon of racism. So that's another element that we have to deal with. And all we're saying is, OK, let's look at what racism is objectively and how can we start to construct this thing and make sense of it so that we can organize against it for revolutionary purposes. Right. OK. Marx gave us an understanding of capitalism. Then what? And Krumah takes it even farther and gives you. Or Marx gave us an understanding of neo uh, of imperialism, right? Capitalism at its highest state. Um, then Krumah gives you neocolonialism, capitalism in it, or imperialism in its final form. I can't remember what the highest state. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, hey, Fanon is telling us, like, bro, use these objective sciences, use these facts to help make sense of your reality. But you, Abbas, can organizing for new African independence in Oakland cannot move as if you are in Germany in 1847 organizing against the, or was 1898 organizing against the factory owner. You just can't. We ain't all, we all, we ain't all centralized in this five block radius anymore, walking over to the factory. You know what I'm saying? There's just different things. Uh, you're not dealing with, Fanon wasn't, uh, Marx wasn't dealing with NATO, the World Trade Organization, AFRICOM. Like, there's different phenomena that we have to, phenomena that we have to deal with. You know what I'm saying? So we can't just affects our daily reality. We can't just, you know, we can't just adopt a methodology and stick that methodology in that time period that Marx was writing in. And it's not even a it. an analysis. It's not even a method. He's, yeah. he's, you can use the methodology dialectical yeah. materialism, but this yeah. shit is a, simply an analysis. Yeah, it's an analysis of his, <laughs> and then people have used it as a quote unquote science, methodology method. in the science. Oh. You know what I'm saying? To make sense of of different situations and it's like nah that's right you dealing with yeah but i mean I'm gonna go on marx go yeah. on marx let's but keep I mean, talking about for now yeah but if you even if you look at it like they want to apply it like you can't apply it to the algerian context that the you know the, the marxists what, what they you you know what i'm saying like okay like a like a uh, a dictatorship of the proletariat does that work in the algerian context no the proletariat because isn't why? the masses of people in 19, between, 19, between 1942, <laughs> 1954, and 1962, where that war is happening, the proletariat is not the masses of the people. It's not. Fanon says only the peasantry is revolutionary. <laughs> so what does that mean? Because they have the least to lose, and they have the most people. And he was talking about the proletariat in the Algerian context had privilege. 
that was in the metropolis that had different material interests that at times would go that would go against the peasantry. He said, no, the peasantry is the ones that formed the revolution. They had the most to lose. They was the most revolutionary. So does that quote unquote, you know, Marxist uh you know, we understand it differently, but the I feel like the Marxists they have their quote unquote methodology. Mm-hmm. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what it is. It's oh, yeah. dialectical material. It's <laughs> no, historical material. Saying, yeah. I was saying maybe it's historical materialism. Like they have their uh, analysis. Like they have their like framework. I would say um, I would doesn't call, apply. Yeah, I would say it's historical materialism. Like, and it's not even a full implementation of historical materialism. Yeah. I would say it's just like making analysis of the past, mm-hmm. and that's it. And then use that past analysis, and then apply it to whatever context. Is. This is the way I've seen it. To some, to, to some of it, right? So to where, like, the Algerian Revolution, Marxists had a hard time understanding, oh, it was the peasantry, not the proletariat. <laughs> the peasantry was the, the, the force, you know what I'm saying? So that's like, how can, even this concept of stretch of Marxism is important because we understand, like, Marx is saying, or uh, Fanon, mm-hmm. <laughs> Fanon is talking about you rich because you white, you white because you rich. Does, the, does Marxism make sense of that? No. Does Marxism make sense of uh, uh, imperialism through the African context? No. They write about imperialism, but they ain't talking about Africa. So how can we use, quote-unquote, Marxism to fully tell the full story and apply it? We can't. So that's why Fanon say, hey, it got to be stretched. <laughs> We could take what's good from it. We can take certain, you know, we could take dialectical material. We could take what's good from it. But we can't have a traditional orthodox <laughs> Marxist way of thinking yeah. to the Algerian situation. Uh, me personally, I would, like, and I say this all the time, I would never identify with one single person's school of thought because that single person is not God. They can't tell me how everything functioned, how it's going to plan out. It's all just theoretical. And All yeah, of this is theoretical. Even the shit that we pushing is just theoretical. You it's know theoretical what I'm saying? until we put it into action. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And only history will tell if it was actually, yeah. if it actually worked for anything, right? But I think to say that you align with a single person's school of thought, you have to start asking yourself like that in itself is some Western way. I mean, it's a reaction know? to. I think you know, it's a reaction. I would say. I mean, even for niggas who you know might call themselves uh, incrumus. No, that's what I'm saying. You feel me? But like, like that's why I say it's a reaction because yeah. why they call themselves an incrumus? They call themselves an incrumus because people is calling themselves what a Marxist. Yeah. In my opinion, Incrumus was a Pan Africanist. His ideology is revolutionary nationalism in a, in a yeah. totally unified Africa. That's not like why would we? I, the only thing I would identify, I, I, I'd identify as a mutakimist. You know, if you look at what mutakim means. It's one of the 99 names of a law. So you feel me? Going back that's, to all, God. that's what going I'm back. saying. So it's, so it's, it's uh, again, I will always say that Marx, Lenin, these people made grave <laughs> contributions to uh, anti capitalists just because they gave you a very clear understanding of the, of the contradictions of capitalism. They did contribute to that without, without, and they helped shape the minds of some of our, uh, of a lot of African leaders. You know what I'm saying? But also, they did have a monopoly on, on information at the time. Let's be very clear with that. Like, it's not yeah, like I mean, it's they discover communalism. Yeah. They didn't. They did not discover if the connection between. If you look at the materialist framework, where it says, uh, you know, all matter is connected. Africans understood that way before. You could you could see that the way that our our, our traditional societies functioned. On average, Africans understood Not historical materialism before "quote unquote" historical materialism was a method. You know, was you know a, a look at the way we treated. Look at the way we treated the earth. The way that we engaged in our agriculture. We our, knew that we sciences. knew that we weren't that we that 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 this what we were connected to this world and that it, that this world exists outside of it, but also in relation to us. That's Marx didn't discover that. Engels didn't discover that. Lenin didn't discover that. And so, yeah. But again, I, I say they made grave contributions because at a time when they had monopoly on information, they made sure that they presented it in a way to where, you know, Africans were able to use to liberate themselves. So I, I respect it, but you know, I, they I, all, yeah. all all of our leaders stretched it. <laughs> all of our leaders stretched it to end. Yeah. Marxism is a product of Western thought. While we on the pro- while we on the topic of Western thought. <laughs> uh, what are Western values, quote unquote values, and then how are they a byproduct of the capitalist economic system? I don't think people always understand how economics governs everything. 
How it's first your economic system, and then from there you get your ideologies, your laws, your norms. I mean, Western values is a philosophical way of thinking about the day-to-day life that benefits the political, social, and economic structure of capitalism and imperialism, right? So when we think about uh, egoism, individualism, uh, arrogance, right, all of these, like, practices, it's inherently tied to the value and the philosophy of a society, right? So the day-to-day actions of always just thinking about yourself, I'm going to get it by any means necessary. The day-to-day actions of thinking that you are the center of the world and everything else is living to support you. You know what I'm saying? Like, literally, yo, your existence is the primal function. Like, these white people sometimes, these Europeans, they'll just walk down the street and they think like they own everything. You know what I'm saying? Right? So these values of uh, self in terms of, like, your self is the highest thing. Like, essentially, you're placing yourself on a pedestal. These values of uh, products, like, I would say even, like, this hyper-materialist way of thinking, right? That's part of the Western values is, oh, I'm only valuable based off of what I have, of what I can consume, of what I can buy, the the shiny car, the newest iPhone, the newest computer, you feel me? Like, those is part of, like, this, the, the quote-unquote ethos. Like, oh, I'm going to get it for myself, and I don't care about nobody else. Right. So part of the process of colonization um, is essentially inserting Western values into the colonized. Right. Because if we have a philosophical system that is valued in the West that teaches us to hate ourselves, but teaches us to be what? Be the colonizer. You know what I'm saying? Like it teaches us to think like the colonizer. Right. Even Fanon talk about every every colonial subject (laughs) thinks about being the colonizer one time. Like, Hey, I just want to replace and he says, all right, sometimes, you know, it's not about just replacing them. They just want to be in, you know, in that type of life. But uh, you sometimes you think, think that's freedom. They think it's freedom. Yeah. You feel me? So your idea of freedom, your idea of independence uh, becomes associated on the values of the West. Right. And uh, the West is a very degenerate culture. The West is a very uh, satanic culture. Right. Uh, where you think, OK, running around naked means you're free. <laughs> where you think being able to do whatever you want at any given moment means you is free or well, meaning you can just uh, well I think western values means like you is like subjecting yourself in many ways to a form of slavery like you is choosing uh, to be a part of this system like now in 2023 like you can say like in many ways we're consenting to our oppression by the way we live you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. like by the way we consume by the way we eat by the way we treat one another right and all of that goes back to what? Fueling the capitalist system, right? If you feel like you can do whatever you want at any given moment and then you have access to your iPhone where you can literally, for the most part, do whatever you want at any given moment, now you have access to what? You can, you can like, why, why can you DoorDash? <laughs> so, you know, there's some certain things that, like, man, like, just wait till life opens up again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you can just access this at any moment and then it comes straight to your door, you know? Um, so looking at these values, they're destructive, right? They're, they're destructive to- towards ourself. Uh, it's what makes us into a thing. So I think a lot of times when we, in this process of decolonization, we have to actually have a new set of philosophy, a new, a new set of values. We have to rid ourselves, um, from this degenerative way of thinking, from this destructive way of thinking, from this, uh, glorification, um, of idols, <laughs> you know, whether it be celebrities, uh, whether it be the newest product, you know what I'm saying? We have to rid ourselves of that type of behavior because that behavior is destructive towards our collective being, our, our collective hard, people. Though, bro. Bro. You know, it, uh, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, that's why I say this always is like a message to self first. Yeah, you know? I be talking, yeah, like I, I value the conversations we be having because it's me really dealing with a lot of my shit in real time as well. Like, you can see the growth we both made, right? But there are like definitely some like very Western things I need to let go of. Like they're definitely. I mean, even like it's Western like, metri- uh, metrics of success. Yeah, but then it's, it comes back down to like when you stop. But then it's like to, yeah. or uh, subscribing to those things. It's like damn, like now what do you like? Oh shit, I feel so raw and vulnerable. Now I got to. I mean, but I think that's like next time I feel that feeling. I think I'm going to try to approach, I'm going to try my best to approach it with like, oh shit, now I have the opportunity to actually be a new African, like form myself in this very new thing. And it's still very hard because like, it is, you know, like, I mean, we live in this Western world, like, 
You feel me? So that's why our true freedom can't come with that's just still here. No, nah, it, it can't. can't. It, it can't. Cannot. You feel me? I don't so care if like, we get the five states. I don't care if we get industry. Like as long as this shit's as still long as it has their power, as long as yeah. there's NATO and AFRICOM and the World Trade Organization, as long as these relations to self, others, and property still exist the way that they are, under I don't care under what guise it is, we'll never be free. I mean, we don't have life as a dignified human being. First, you feel me? So how how can we fully rid ourselves from these systems and Western values when literally like sometimes our survival is based off of us engaging in it? You know what I'm saying? Like, our, like you feel me? Because it's like, you know, I'm like, okay, I believe all these things. Then it's like, I have to think about retirement. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, my my, you feel me? I have to think about my well, future. You will be, you will be a like, fool not to. Shoot, I got. I can't just be in this uh, uh, revolutionary s- state of neurosis where I forget about the actual material reality of like my day to day and some of the things I want to achieve in life. You will be a fool not to want to be able to have a family one day. I, okay, I have to think about these certain things, but this is also meaning that I'm having to engage in some type of like Western way of thinking. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it's these these contradictions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We can't fully rid Western values until the masses of people become conscious, until the masses of people begin to reclaim our humanity, right? Because the the value system of the West, the ethos of the West, it relies on the complete control of the land, the complete control of the government, the complete control of all of these institutions. And until we were able to collectively remove that, you feel me? We ain't ever gonna be free. We ain't ever gonna be able to uh, fully reject these these Western values at all. We can't. <laughs> we can't. That's it's just a, it's the fact of the matter. You know. Um, that's why I guess like it has to be revolution, right? It has to be moving from that thing <laughs> into a dignified human being, and then that's why these revolutionary. Uh, it's important to try and put these values into practice now. Right, because what good is a revolution if we have this revolution, and then we regress, and we still have all of these Western values still inside of our head, but we've quote unquote had a successful revolution. That will mean you feel me. The parasite of neo-colonialism will be upon us because we still have that uh, parasite. We haven't fully killed. We haven't been violent with that parasite within our own value system. You know what I'm saying? To where now we've evolved into a revolutionary value system in this new way of living, you know? Yeah, well, we was at the farm yesterday, and JoJo asked me, like, do you ever think we'll be able to settle our, like, personal quarrels and shit? I'm like, look, I mean, of course, you had nations and shit, uh, let's say pre-colonial Africa, right? You had nations feuding over land, territory, whatever, like, they would have their wars, you know what I'm saying? Uh, But we also don't know how that would have played out if colonization never happened, now you get Western values of mass accumulation of uh, super exploitation again, because slavery did exist on the continent prior to, but not in its form, not in its like the Europe. Europe gave Africa its most vicious forms of slavery, right? And so we don't know like what our what our trajectory was. Like, we don't know how we would have healed and became one, right? There's this. I think I don't know if it's either Fernando or Yaki, but he says like we seek to uh, attain such a high level of consciousness in all members of society that the norms of law and morality uh, merge into a single code of conduct. Like, that might have actually happened for Africa, you know, uh, if the Portuguese would have never touched, <laughs> would have never touched down, right? We don't know what would have happened. Um, but JoJo asked, I'm like, I believe that we can't even fathom what human relationships will look like because all we've seen is, for the last damn near half millennium, is our relationships in response to colonialist endeavors, to colonialist norms and needs? Like I don't even like, I don't. You know, I wonder what it would look like to look at other human beings if I'm not so insecure in myself. If like if I'm not so insecure in this world, like what does it look like to engage with other humans? If they not insecure, if they not insecure in this world, if we are actually working to build, I mean, we see it. But I've. My relationship to self is, and my relationship to others is changing by being in constant community around them and going out and trying to change the world together. And so if we get actual mass contribution to society, mass thinkers, um, masses of people who see value in their own lives and human lives and 
Yeah, this diff, I'm not trying to get on no utopian, you know, one world all the time, but I truly believe that the way we can't begin to see how humans will function amongst each other because all we have known is strife, struggle, competition, feast or famine for the last 500 years, especially in the new African context. The moment we stepped on these shores, it was about self to some extent. The 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 collective was thus now about it was like self then collective damn near you have to start thinking about yourself versus traditional African society is like the tribe came first not at the expense of the individual but you knew that this thing mattered no one was bigger than the program program being the way of the nation the way of the tribe if that's where we come from and to now being like even I have to think at times I'm like. Yeah, so I'm thinking about self, you know, and not that you lose that sense of self, but we, I, I truly don't believe we can fathom what this world will look like when we are actually like break free from like the matrix type shit. Like you don't know what security is. You don't know. You never experienced true I mean, security. You don't know ever. what it is until you experience it. <laughs> you don't you know, actually we, know we, what we, safety we, is. No, we could theorize it, you know. But now we imagine me and We you. don't know like that feeling though. You know what I'm saying? Don't know. Don't so know. imagine me and you actually two human beings that are sound and safe in every way, shape, and form. How do we start to engage one another? What does disagreement even actually look like? You know what I'm saying? Like what what does it what like what does that actually look like? What does it mean to not like somebody? The fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, so now when y'all is aligned on the same moral and value. In the same inherent spirit. Now, what are y'all funking over? Even Man. the most minute dispute, like even okay, we talking about building a nation. Like okay, so now we, you know, heightened levels of consciousness, heightened understanding, we securing ourselves. Now, when a boss says, "I think we should lay the pipe this way," and I say we should lay the pipe this way, now what does it look like that? Pro- what does that process of struggle look like? When a boss says, "You know, you in the cadre," and I think this interpretation is that, and I think this interpretation is this. Now, what does it look like for us to work through that when we both secure human beings and not thinking like, oh, this nigga trying to one up me or this nigga trying to embarrass me? Or they're like, what does that look like now? We don't know because we never had it. At least I haven't. I've never just been completely sure of self. And even the times where I have confidence, it's, feel me, it's damn near, uh, is it real confidence? How can you be confident in a world that's. Where you Constant, within, you know what I'm saying? How can you, you really within. be confident? Now I might be lying to myself to work myself up, but I'm not trying to get too metaphysical. But you like, I really don't no, think we can actually like believe. You know, I mean, this is uh, like psychoanalysis of it. Yeah. It is. You feel me? So for not having is a, is a psychoanalysis, right? Because what the Western world does is subjects us to their culture. You feel me? That's why they had, quote unquote, like Fanon talk about them, symposiums on culture. And we create these different radio free institutions and these working groups for oppressed people. The the West will do to advocate. You know, what I'm saying? like that's the same thing we have now. These counterinsurgent strategies of culture, of quote unquote culture. You know what I'm saying? To where they uh, say, OK, yeah, we're going to insert this group. We're going to uh, say we really care, but it's really a counterinsurgent tactic. Oh, yeah, we're going to integrate you and give you some representation, but that's actually we representing you to death. But you, we, you know, like this is the way the West is working and the way is, is the, these cultural wars. That's what we up against is how a war on the complete wretched, <laughs> on the complete thing. It's a, it's a war. It's a war because we think that engaging in this system, like how sick is it to like really to think about it like, like how sick is it to think that like we can actually integrate into this system and be okay? That like freedom can come from that, right? That's a result of culture, uh, of a cultural war. Think like, okay, now if we just dress this way, talk this way, cut our hair this way, look this way, and you feel me, essentially remove our human dignity <laughs> to fit in today's system. Now we up against some cultural wars right now, some cultural wars. It, even it's it's from people who look like us, but who's orchestrating it all? Yeah, hey, you're American capitalist imperialist. Man, you got the city of Oakland. You got all these people unhoused, but then you got a bunch of people talking about save the A's and going and buying tickets to the A's game. Nigga, fuck the A's. <laughs> <laughs> That's I've been seeing that. Like, that I haven't seen that. I seen something recently. I'm like, bro, why do y'all care about the A's, man? But that's just how they can manufacture. But that's emotion why, at any given moment. You feel me? And the, but that's why I so uh, they can manufacture democracy. Oh, now you got a choice. 
Like, go buy this ticket. Man, fuck. Go buy this ticket to save the A's, to show the owner and tell him to sell. Like, are you are you kidding me? He made a shit ton of money that day. Are you kidding me? He laughing. He he's sitting there in his in his suit laughing at y'all. Like <laughs> these idiots. <laughs> you know, it like that's that's why it takes a mass consciousness shifting, right? Again, that decolonization process, right? Because for now, he talked about he says in the period of decolonization, the colonized masses uh, thumb their noses at these very values and shower them with insults and vomit them up. You feel me? Only the people realizing what's happening and conscious of their situation as things, as the rich, can then they begin to reject it until when they hear these Western values being spewed, even if it's from people who look like them. Man, fuck. You feel me? Man, we ain't, we ain't hearing this. Boo. That, that's where that, that's where that come from. You acting, that's where that you acting white shit come from. That's when the masses of niggas was coming and be like, nah, you on that white shit. Yeah, like, that was that, that <laughs> was actually us rejecting the white. Hey, man, you, yeah. you acting on this you white, acting white. white. You acting white. <laughs> man, you on this Western shit. That's what yeah. like that's us thumbing our noses at this culture that they pushing on us. Mm-hmm. Man, let's get back to that shit. It was just identify it properly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it is white. Because <laughs> white means West. <laughs> it's wild. White mean power. <laughs> I'm thinking about um like you can tell this is such a world in turmoil. Whether you look at it from the economics, right, where you have 40 million people in the U.S. <laughs> Myself, <laughs> I'm in turmoil right now. <laughs> you say, but I'm about to get to that. You got 40 million people who live in poverty, right? You got, you got, like we just said, 10,000 vacant homes in Oakland, 5,000 people sleeping on the street. Like, what? How do you justify this? And then, 200 million look at how many people walk around with, with hives, with IBS. You feel me like real shit anxiety like bro this is we're literally economically and physically in a state and you wonder why the world isn't the way that it is like people are really worried around running around worried about where their next meal going to come from shelter things that are just like should be afforded to you when you come into this when you come on when you come onto planet earth these are things you should have that don't make y'all think like what's going on really we know something is wrong and it's very easy. We just don't need a capitalist system. We don't need capitalism. There shouldn't be a, a centralization, a hoarding of wealth in the world's resources. And that's why we got to do this, this hard work of reorienting ourselves, of changing ourselves, of making that conscious decision uh, to not be subjected to the constant stimuli of the West to the constant indoctrination of the West and become conscious of the way that they're trying to uh, form us into these quote unquote things that can be exploited day in and day out. You know, and that, that reorientation process is hard. It's difficult. It's, it's uncomfortable, but that's the only way that if we say we want to live a life of dignity, a life of being actual human beings, we got to struggle with ourselves. You feel me? Day in, day out, moment by moment. Second by second, millisecond by millisecond. Uh, and of course, you know, we're always going to deal with those contradictions that show up. But there's always a path back to revolution. There's always a path uh, back to independence. There's always a path back to reclaiming our own humanity. And let's just figure out a way to keep going back to that path. Even though that path might not always look like a straight line. It's going to look down. It's going to go up. It's going to go sideways sometimes. But ultimately, we have that right to freedom. That right to independence, that right to go from the wretched to go to some human beings. Hopefully, y'all enjoyed this episode and learned something. Organize. <laughs>